Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. There is this part of us that when somebody we admire and respect we feel is attacked or they or their, um, their person is, is uh, under attack, we come to their defense, right? So you have Hollywood figures, right? Hollywood figures who somehow fall into disgrace, but people who uh, respect them and have admired their work will come to their defense even when it doesn't make sense. One of those things is happening right now if you follow sports, and even if you don't follow sports, uh, you're probably aware of it. We're in spring training right now for baseball. Today, uh, the position players are reporting, and soon uh, spring training games are going to start. Well, what this has brought to the front again this last week was the cheating scandal by the Houston Astros. (laughs) Dodger fans. And there are people who will come to their defense. You know, even though we sit there and say, it's obvious, they've been caught. We saw it recently, too, in the impeachment trial, that there were those who had come to the defense of President Trump. Why? Because they admire and respect him. Well, you have probably been a person who's done that in your life. That somebody that you love and respect came under attack. It may have been falsely. They may not have been deserving at all. And and you came to their defense and you stood up for them. Maybe it's happened to you. Where you've gone through a time in your life where you felt that you were being attacked by somebody. and you, You hadn't done it. And there were people that surround you that stood up for you too. Well, something similar to that is what is happening in Peter's life. Peter's coming to the defense of Jesus. When Peter interprets what's going on as being an attack on Jesus, when probably it's not, and I'll get into that in a second. Peter stands up for Jesus. Why? Because he respects and admires Jesus. Well, let's go into the text. Matthew chapter 17, in your pew Bibles, uh, our text is on page 823, page 823 in the pew Bibles. It's a short text again this week. Uh, A lot here, though, that we wanted to dig into. You're sure welcome to use your your Bible you brought with you as well. It's Matthew chapter 17, beginning at verse 24, and you can dial that up on your phone or electronic device you brought with you, too. All I want to do to begin with is just read the first verse and a little bit of verse 25. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. It's got to be the shortest answer Peter has ever given to a question. I, I'm in, the, in my own devotional life, life right now. I've been reading through the Gospels, and I don't remember Peter giving a one-word answer to a question in any other part of the Gospel. I may be wrong about that, um, but I, I think about just the chapter previous to this where uh, Jesus had asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And he said, you know, uh, prophet, Elijah, so on and so forth. And Jesus says... Who do you say that I am? And what did Peter say? You are the Christ. And then he adds to that, the Son of the living God. So it's a brief phrase, but it's not one word. It's hard to find Peter uh, answering with a one word answer. However, how uh, quickly he answers is definitely within his character, right? Uh, Peter will speak up very quickly, and he comes to Jesus' defense. Yes, of course he does. He, of course he pays the, the two drachma text. Ah, we got to talk about this. i got to give you a little bit of background here because it's going to be very important you understand this as we get further into this message this morning. The true two drachma text, this tax is not a tax of the Roman government. This is the temple tax. Go back to Exodus chapter 30. You'll find it there. Okay? So, kind of curious here, interesting. Do you notice how Matthew, who was a tax collector, right? Matthew was a tax collector, collecting taxes for the Roman government. How he distances himself from those who are collecting this tax. He doesn't call them tax collectors, does he? 
it would have been a lot easier for him to do that, but he doesn't. What he says is, those who collect the two drachma text, tax. You see, the tax is not in the same realm as the Roman government tax. You see, Matthew could add to whatever he wanted to put onto the tax for himself and get wealthy off of his collecting taxes, not these guys. They could only and specifically collect two drachmas, which is about two days' worth of wages. A bit, but not overbearing. And they were to collect it from every male 20 years of age and older. But these guys would not be wealthy. And they would not be hated in the same way that Matthew was hated. Now, they may not have liked him as much. But still, they would be actively engaged in worship in the synagogue. They'd be able to go to the temple and offer the sacrifices at the temple because they're doing what God had said needed to be done, again, in Exodus chapter 30. And their question to Peter is really an honest question. I'm not sure Peter took it that way. But they're simply asking the question, does he collect the tax? Does he pay the tax? And, and there's no malice in their question. You know, at other times, Matthew will go out of his way to tell us that the religious leaders were trying to trap Jesus with their questions. It's not said here, is it? Nowhere to say. It's just simply asking a question. Why would they ask that question? Well, let's get back into a little bit of the culture of that time. You see, we're not sure that the priest or the, uh, or, or, or the rabbis or some of the rabbis would pay this tax. They would see themselves as kind of exempt for from it because of the work that they did. And so their question would be kind of this honest question saying, well, does he pay it because other guys don't? And Peter, probably because now for three years he's been with Jesus, understand this is Jesus' last time to be in Galilee before, uh, uh, before he's crucified and risen from the dead. He's only there for a short period of time, by the way. And, and, and soon, um, Jesus would be, be heading, heading off uh, for his passion for us. But anyway, um, Peter's question and uh, answer is just very simply, yes. He's, he'd been experienced before all that, all that um, trapping of Jesus by the religious leaders. And he probably takes it as a defense for Jesus. Whereas Peter stands up for Jesus, Jesus actually comes to Peter's defense in what follows. So let's go back to the text. We'll pick up where we left off in verse 25 and read through verse 26. So after Peter says yes, then we read on further. And when he came, Peter that is, into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take uh, toll or tax? From the, their sons or from others? And when he had said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. So let's, let's get the scene here a little bit. It's going to kind of uh, important, I think, to, to understanding what's going on here. Peter is in Capernaum, right? And, and, and he's out somewhere in the community, maybe by the seashore. Because remember, Capernaum is spread out along the Sea of Galilee. And there's a lot of activity around the, the shoreline, lots of boats there. And maybe Peter's walking along there, skipping some stones into the Sea of Galilee. Maybe he's in the marketplace getting food. Maybe he just needs some time alone. But he's not with Jesus. But these collectors of the two drachma attacks would have recognized Peter from the, the activity of, of Jesus' life, and, and, and they confront him. But Jesus, the important part here is that Jesus does not hear the conversation. So Peter returns from that now, and he enters into the house, maybe his house, and maybe it's just he and Jesus at this time, the other disciples aren't around. And the first thing that happens is Jesus speaks, not Peter. It's not Peter saying, hey, guess what just happened? But it's Jesus who speaks first. And he says, what do you think, Simon? Um, if you were Peter, what would you be thinking at that point? 
What did I do wrong again? <laughs> you know, three years I've been messing up. So what I do? Or here we go again. I'm going to get some lecture about something. Or well, did, I, did I not get the memo? Was I supposed to be here earlier or something? But Jesus initiates the discussion. That's important. Because Jesus goes on and asks him a question, right? That's what Jesus does. Look at the Gospels. He teaches by asking so many questions, and he does that with Peter. What do you think, Peter? What do you think, Simon? Kings, kings of the earth. Are they going to collect taxes from their sons, their children, or are they going to collect them from other people? And for Peter, you've got to understand, that's an, there's an obvious answer to that. It may not be as obvious to us, so... Uh, you, you're probably a lot more intelligent than I am, but it took me a while to figure this out. They're not going to collect taxes from their own kids because they supported their family with those taxes. So why would I collect a tax from my son and say, hey, give me your tax and then give it back to him because that's what basically you'd be doing. Of course, it's obvious. Peter kind of slammed. said, well, that's an easy one. You're trying to trap me? I'm not sure where this is going. Well, from others. Then Jesus gets to the main point. This is what we've got to wrestle with now then the sons are free, then the children are free. What Jesus is saying to Peter is that he's free from all those requirements, those ritual requirements surrounding the temple. So let's go back to last week's sermon that Pastor Jeffrey preached on. Remember, that was basically about the Sabbath, but Jesus said something else in that text that applies to what's happening here. Jesus said something greater than the temple is here. And that something is someone, and that's Jesus. That Jesus replaces the temple. And those who belong to Jesus, that are sons of Jesus, that are daughters of Jesus, are set free. They are truly free and don't have to do the requirements that are demanded in the law anymore. I'm not sure if Peter got it. I don't think he did at this point. But Jesus was calling him a son of the kingdom. But he's also saying to you and me, we are daughters and we are sons of the king and we're free. But here's the difficulty for us. You see, in this text, in the story, the freedom that's being referred to is all that ritual stuff that surrounds the temple. Well, we've never felt in bondage to any of that. If we are a son, if we are a daughter of the kingdom, what are we free from? I'm glad you asked. There are three things that you and I are free from that dominate our lives. And you've heard Pastor Jeffrey and I say these before, and we'll say them again. First of all, we're free from sin. That Jesus, this king of our life, ruled upon a cross, right? That was his throne. Bearing your sin, my sin, and it no longer haunts us. We are free. Now, granted, we still wrestle with it. I get that. But we are free. You are truly free from your sin and the consequences of your sin. Jesus sets you free. You're also free from death. And Jesus says that when we believe in him, the one who believes in him will not die, but have eternal life. And, and that's hard for us to understand. You see, uh, the Holy Cross was a affected by death this week. We had three funerals in three days, not here necessarily. We had two of them were here. Uh, one of them was affected me especially because of uh, my work with this man, but some of you may remember Mike Adams who suddenly died. He was the president of our congregation uh, back in 10, 000, uh, 20, uh, 2010 and that, uh, around then, and he played a significant role for me. And going to his funeral, which Pastor Dave had, had, had done, was very difficult. He's dead. His ashes were right there in front of Pastor Dave as, as he preached. Last week, and this we uh, rejoiced with Lucille Varner's family as uh, she had turned 104 last Sunday. One hour after her birthday, she died. 
and their funeral was, was Friday. And then yesterday, um, Marion Reeder, Debbie Shelton's mom, uh, had a full day of, of, of celebrating her life uh, and funerals both here in our uh, both here at Holy Cross and in Arvada. Death is real, and I know that by sharing those stories with you, that's connecting with you with someone in your life too. And yet, Jesus says we're free from death. We won't die. You see, we trust in the resurrection. And that those three people are going to rise from the dead when Christ returns. Death has already been conquered. I think it's for that reason that there's kind of this consistency in the Bible. When it talks about a Christian dying, it talks about him being asleep in the Lord. Talking about the physical body and that body that's laid to rest and those are out in our columbarium. Because we trust in the victory of the resurrection. So we're free from sin, we're free from death, and you are also free from Satan. And his accusing finger, right, which you feel almost every day, all of us do. Sinner saying, basically saying to you and me, you're no good. Yeah, yeah, Jesus died for you, but so you still mess up every day. You think you're a Christian, but you're not living up to the standard that, that, you, that God sets for you in his word. The accusing finger, it's always there, pointing at us, pointing at us, pointing at us. But we're free from Satan. That's freedom. And it changes the way we live. I'm very grateful, though, in this text, it didn't stop at verse 26. Verse 27 is extremely important for us. Let's look at it. Verse 27, again on page 823 in your pew Bibles. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Now, it would be kind of fun to think about what went through Peter and so forth, and he was told to do this and, and get all wrapped around this fish having a shekel in its mouth, which would have been four drachmas, which would have paid for both uh, Jesus and for Peter. We miss the main point. The main point comes at the beginning of this verse. Jesus says, so as not to give offense, not to be a scandal. To whom? To those who are collecting the tax. Remember I said that, I, that their question was an honest question. They weren't trying to trap Jesus. And Jesus cares about them. And so not to give offense to them, not to cause an offense to them, let's pay the tax. We're free to do that. We're free to serve, even though we don't have to, even though it's not required. If something greater than the temple is here, let's do it anyway. It's not sinful to pay the two dragon attacks. In fact, it was in Scripture. But we're not doing it because we have to. We just don't want to give offense. And I think that has an important message to you and me. We are free. Free from sin. Free from death. Free from Satan. But we're not to use our freedom to cause offense for people. You see, there's a great world out there that doesn't understand our freedom and doesn't understand just how powerful it is in our lives. And our job is not to go out there and say, look, I'm free and you're still a slave. I'm better than you is what I'm getting at. What did Jesus do? He served. He said of himself, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And Paul echoes those words in Philippians chapter 2. That we're to have the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. Who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself and became a servant. Our freedom means we're free to serve. And that's our short-term mission trip. Our short-term mission trip is to enjoy the freedom, absolutely, that we have won in Christ Jesus. But to use that freedom to serve and not give offense. 
the text leaves us with an interesting question. Did Peter go and do it? Did, it doesn't say. It doesn't say whether he did. And so I'm going to leave you with that question. Will you do it? Will you use your freedom as a way to serve? Amen.